Welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by Toradex entitled Over the Air is Not Enough, ResinIO's robust solution for embedded software deployment. We're excited to introduce you to our partner and guest for today's webinar, ResinIO. My name is Brandon Shibley and joining me today is Ronald McCollum, Solutions Architect at Resin. This is a very simple outline for today's webinar. I'll give a brief introduction and then we'll quickly jump into the presentation from Ronald who will formally introduce you to Resin, the problems that it addresses and what exactly makes it special. After a few slides, Ronald will transition into a real-life demonstration of Resin I.O. in action on the Toradex Calibri IMX6. And finally, we'll wrap up with a question and answer session. As I mentioned, this webinar is hosted by Toradex. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Toradex, we specialize in embedded computing solutions, particularly uh, ARM-based system on modules, or SOMs. We have two families of SOMs within which the modules are pin compatible and interchangeable. We perform hardware and software development uh, in-house, and Toradex generally guarantees 10-year product lifecycle support. We offer free technical support directly from our developers, and our sales are also handled directly by Toradex, and our products can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allowing us to serve the needs of regional markets with local warehouses and local sales and technical support. Since 2003, Toradex has supported thousands of customers, enabling new and exciting products and helping to push the limits in a multitude of diverse industrial and embedded markets which is where ResinIO comes into the picture. Advances in technology continue to push our customers' requirements. Connected devices are increasingly becoming the norm, even in the embedded industrial markets. Remote deployment, centralized management, and end-to-end -end security are all expectations in this new IoT world. Our partnership with ResinIO began just about a year ago when I initially reached out to Resin, and to our surprise, they were setting up their headquarters in Seattle not far from our Toradex office in Seattle, which has allowed us to establish an excellent partnership. Resin joined us in our booth ArmTechCon last year. They've ported their platform to our Calibri IMX6 module, and now this webinar is our first major push to educate the Toradex customer base about the capabilities of Resin. So we hope that this is just the beginning, and we're very interested to hear your feedback. Feel free to provide any feedback from the webinar um, in the chat or uh, question dialogues, as well as any questions you may have, and we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand over control um, to Ronald of ResinIO. Great, thank you very much, Brandon. I will share out my screen here. Yeah, so I'm Ronald McCollum. I'm a solution architect at resin.io. So what I will be doing is walking through a brief set of slides about what Resin is and how it functions. We'll get a little bit into the technical architecture, but uh, we'll save some of the, the technical details if people have questions and want to dive deep on that at some point in the future. Uh, and then I will go into a live demonstration of how Resin actually functions and show being able to push over-the-air updates to a Toradex Calibri IMX6 board. Uh, from a very simple web and uh, terminal console. And uh, I personally uh, am in Boston, Massachusetts, so the resin office is in Seattle, but uh, I'm several thousand miles away, so it's a, a very distributed organization. I was fortunate enough to get to meet uh, Brandon in person last time I was in Seattle. So without further ado, I'll kick things off here. And really the most important thing to discuss is how software release cycles work today. Uh, and we talk about the web bringing an end to the annual software release cycle. If you think about the way things were maybe 15, 20 years ago in software development, it looked a lot like how hardware release cycles look today. You would uh, perform a production release of a piece of software, you would push that release out the door, and then really very infrequently would you release updates for that, maybe once or twice a year, um, maybe once a quarter for something that was updating very, very frequently. The software world has really moved on from that. If you think about how web services and software as a service works today, you might be doing multiple releases per month, even per week. Uh, in some cases, even multiple releases of software updates into production every single day without breaking or taking down that production environment. 
So there's been a lot of really heavy development into making tools that can do this effectively, enabling developers to make very fast, iterative changes to software, to release it, and to be sure that when they do those releases, that the changes that they have made will not break the production environment in any way. But if you look at the hardware side, it really has stayed largely the same. It is that annual release cycle where you manufacture a device, you push it out the door, and then you really very infrequently release any sort of update to that. What we at Resin want to do is bring those tools from the web world to the embedded hardware world. So to be able to update Internet of Things devices on a monthly, weekly, even daily schedule, but ensure that those changes are always delivered safely and do not break the devices that they are pushed out to. And there are really three main drivers for this. The first of which, overwhelmingly, is the scale of the Internet of Things market. If you think back to what smartphones have done in comparison to standard desktop PCs and laptops, they have absolutely dwarfed the number of devices that are out in the field. There are far more smartphones than traditional computers in the world today. We see the same thing happening with the Internet of Things in comparison to phones. So that same multiple order of magnitude shift in number of devices is happening in the Internet of Things today and will continue to happen for the foreseeable future. So we are going to have more and more devices on a scale that has never been seen before anywhere in the world. And at the same time, those devices are becoming more complex and more powerful. Uh, you could really get away with doing infrequent updates to devices when they were very simple devices. If you had 8-bit microcontrollers that weren't really running very complex code, there's not a lot that can go wrong with that, so you don't need to update it frequently. But what we're seeing now is more and more basically Linux computers pushed out into the environment. An embedded system today looks a lot like a very high-end computer from 15 years ago. So naturally, we, want, we have this power, we have all this uh, additional infrastructure and ability. We want to take advantage of that. But along with that infrastructure and ability comes complexity. So you need to be able to manage this complexity and be able to update more and more robust and large software products. And finally, just as a result of this scale and complexity, we're seeing more and more de developers. Again, orders of magnitude of increase in the number of developers for IoT applications versus web or mobile devices. So we need to find ways that scale not only to number of devices, but scale to adding coders or having multiple coders, multiple people working on an individual application within the Internet of Things environment. And this is what Resin.io aims to do. We want to bring these tools from the web world into the embedded uh, hardware market so that you can develop, deploy, and configure, and provision your application on devices securely, at scale, and uniformly. Um, I think most of this is very clear with the potential exception of uniformly. I want to touch on that very briefly. The idea here is that we want to enable you to produce the same code or take the same code that you have written for one device and seamlessly transition that to another. It's really only recently been an option as we have evolved from the simple microcontroller-based model to a more complex general-purpose Linux computing model. Uh, because we have this power of different Linux devices, uh, but all running the same software environment, it becomes much more feasible to produce a piece of software in a high-level language rather than assembly code, and then be able to cross-compile or retarget that code at individual devices. Uh, we see this at Resin as being absolutely core to the development of the Internet of Things market. Of course, you want to be able to continue to use the code that you've already written as you iterate your hardware and as you move that to new platforms, such as uh, the Toradex platforms. So being able to retarget this code and push it to multiple devices is absolutely key to this product. And we do have a number of users in a, a wide variety of industries right now using this. You can think of things like retail and point of sale. If you are producing devices that are in every store in, in thousands of locations around the country or around the world, it becomes a real issue to update those devices when a security vulnerability is found or even when you want to roll out new features and new integrations with those devices uh, and other devices that you have added to the store. Sort of on the other end of scale is smart buildings. So rather than being distributed in thousands of locations around the world, you have only one location. But that location has some very mission-critical pieces that need to function and be updated 
that may not be immediately accessible. So think about things like HVAC controllers or even the louver controls on the side of skyscrapers to be able to open and close the windows. These are things that absolutely have to function for the building to be usable and inhabitable, but the embedded systems that manage these may be very difficult to access. So you still need some way of being able to update these devices and manage them while ensuring that you are not going to cause any issue or damage the device in the process. And just one other simple example here is digital signage. Again, you can have a very large distributed network of signs that you need to update or manage remotely. And in fact, we know quite a great deal about this particular market because this is really the genesis of Resin. This is where Resin.io came from. We had a project where our founders were working uh, during the London Olympics to deliver digital signage to uh, various locations around the city of London. So think things like garbage cans, sides of buildings, etc. The problem became when the software needed to be updated on all of these devices, a single bad push caused an issue where every single one of these devices was not accessible through the network and did not have functioning code running on it. So you had people with PhDs who had founded this company walking around in the rain in London with USB sticks and USB keyboards trying to locate all of these different devices to be able to plug in and update them and get them back on the network so that they were working successfully. This was a huge problem and really pointed out to us a glaring gap in the industry in that there really isn't or, or wasn't at the time a way of managing and updating devices in the field safely. There were a number of over-the-air solutions and a number of ways to cobble these things together, but as soon as you push out something that wasn't sufficiently tested, you could potentially break these devices and have uh, a very expensive and time-consuming process of sending people out into the field to update them on site rather than being able to take advantage of the network capabilities of these devices. So how does Resin address this? How do we fix this problem? This is really what's going on behind the scenes. And if you think about this from a developer perspective, especially if you have some uh, background in software as a service or the web development world, some of this will probably look very familiar. A developer's perspective is really here on the left. They write their code. They're doing this locally on their laptop or desktop or possibly a, a test environment. But they write their code. They do their local compilation and local testing. And when they're satisfied with this, they commit that code to a source code repository. We use Git in this case, just as it is a, a very popular distributed uh, software version control system. So from the developer's perspective, once they've done their local development and their testing, they're more or less done. They commit that code into a central server somewhere. And from there, all sorts of automated testing, continuous integration, uh, and deployment processes can take effect. But the developer doesn't have to really think about this. The scale for the developer is very, very easy. They write their code, they do their local tests, they commit, and they are done. Now behind the scenes, everything in the dotted lines in the middle of the screen here, this is really the key of what Resin is doing. So when that developer commits their code and pushes it, Resin is going to receive that get push. So it's going to take the code from the developer. We then will cross-compile that code to target whatever the deployment environment is. So the developer can be working on an x86 system, a laptop, a desktop, and the target environment might be an ARM system, like a Calibri IMX6. It doesn't really matter because we are going to abstract away from the developer all of the complexity of managing those different uh, platforms and deployment processes. So we take that code, we cross-compile it, and then we put that into a Docker container. Docker is another concept from the, uh, the web and software as a service development world, which, if you're not familiar with containerization, is very similar to virtual machines. So everyone, I think, knows what a virtual machine at this point is. A virtual machine just encapsulates um, a virtualized hardware environment, your software, and all the necessary libraries and support software to make your software work. Containers are very, very similar. The only difference is they leave out the virtualization part. So a container contains your program, your code. It contains all of the libraries and user space necessary for your code to run. And it also contains uh, a root file system, basically an operating system uh, user space environment. But all of this runs natively on the device. So this is running within the same kernel space as the OS on the, uh, the target platform. 
So this is, if it's an ARM system, it is running in an ARM kernel. If it is an x86 system, it is running in an x86 system. So you do not have some of the overhead that is involved with virtualizing away the, the underlying hardware platform and can also take advantage of the native hardware on a device. What this really means is during this containerization process, you are not isolated from the physical hardware on your device. So if you have GPIO on the device or something connected directly um, to the bus or to USB, all of that hardware is directly available to your application. Nothing needs to be changed or virtualized. So it's a very low touch process from the application developer side. Ideally, there should be no code changes required to run in this sort of environment. You can take the same code you're running natively on a device, but wrap it into this layer of uh, deployment and management process. So at this point, we've taken the code, we have built it, cross-compiled it, put it into a Docker container. So we have a, a basically a container that has everything we need to run this application. At this point, Resin pushes this out onto the end devices. So step three here, pushing out into the device. And this can be accomplished through any mechanism supported by the device. Anything that has a basically a connection to the internet can receive this, uh, this container update. That means these could be connected through Ethernet, through Wi-Fi, even through 2G, 3G radios. We have a lot of technology on the back end to ensure that we are not wasting bandwidth when pushing these. If anybody is familiar with Docker, you know that Docker does a lot of um, things like layer technology where it will store sometimes redundant information with inside of Docker. We actually strip that out. We push only changes from the central server to the end device. So even if your application is a gigabyte in size, if you make a 3K change to that application, your devices are only going to be pushed a 3K update, not an entire one gigabyte uh, package Docker container of this. This is really important, especially when you're talking about 2G, 3G networks where you don't have a, a very large amount of bandwidth and can't necessarily wait for these things to land or you're paying by the byte. It becomes very expensive to push gigabytes of data that way. So we do push only deltas out to the devices and that can be through any connectivity that, 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 that the device supports. Finally, we wrap some telemetry information from the devices back into the resin services, so back into step four here. That means that we can see at any point what version of the software a device is running. We can do some management of the device and of the application container, so we can do restarts, we can do reboots of the physical device if that's necessary. We can even do things like hot handover from one container to another. And what I mean by that is you can have one version of your software, say that's version 1.0 running on the device. You need to push version 2.0 because you're adding some features or you're fixing some bugs. But the device itself really cannot tolerate downtime. This is a mission critical device. So what we can do is we can push version 2 onto the device while version 1 is still running. So we have both versions running in separate containers simultaneously. We can then hand over all of the running state from the first version, from version 1, into version 2. And then only when version 2 has performed all of its checks and make sure that everything is running correctly will we shut version 1 down. Uh, we've done a, an example of this. Uh, that is online from DockerCon uh, about six weeks ago, where we actually updated drone flight software while the drone was in flight on stage using exactly this mechanism. So there was about a 150 millisecond window where we were not receiving telemetry from the device as the network connection handed over, uh, but everything else remained up and running the entire time. The drone did not physically crash uh, as it would have if we had pushed a bad update to it. So um, there are a lot of really fantastic safety and update mechanisms baked into this platform. Um, but having this uh, back channel into the devices through a VPN. Incidentally, everything is always encrypted over the wire. There's no worry about passing um, any of your code or credentials in the clear. Uh, but having this back channel into the devices lets you not only push these updates, but verify that they were delivered correctly. So again, I can always see at any time what version of software is running on these devices. And the devices can even um, lock themselves to say, hey, I'm doing something mission critical. I can't receive an update right now. I will let you know when it's okay for me to, to receive an updated version. So if you have things like maintenance windows or um, mission critical tasks that you cannot interrupt, this can be handled here as well. And we'll see some of this as I go through the demo. I'll step through um, how some of this looks and how this behaves. And the last bit here before we actually get into the demo 
is the on-device software architecture. So physically on the device are the boxes in green here down at the bottom. And what this represents is what we call the resin OS. This is based on Linux. It is Yocto Linux, so it is a very slim, trimmed down version of Linux. Basically, the only things running natively on the hardware itself are the Linux kernel uh, in order to bring the device up, uh, a very small user space in order to support the Docker runtime environment, and the Docker environment itself, this resin container engine. Nothing else is actually running directly on the device. Everything else is containerized. And that does include most of the resin services themselves. So everything in yellow here on the left are the resin services that enable all of the functionality I talked about on the previous slide. All of this is also running inside of a containerized environment. And what that means is that we can take advantage of the same mechanisms that we use to update your application over the air to update resin over the air. So as we add new features to the, to the platform or as we fix bugs in the platform, those changes can be rolled out safely and securely without disrupting the actual behavior of the device itself because we can use those same mechanisms to bring up a new container, hand over state, and shut down the old one. Of course, all of that also applies to your application running inside of a separate container. So again, a restart of your application does not affect the native hardware on the device and does not affect the resin services. And similarly, a restart of the resin services or an update of the resin services does not in any way affect your application container. So we can update the resin services and add new features without ever rebooting or restarting your application or impacting it in any way. Uh, and there, this also, this model gives us the ability to add on new functionality in new containers in the future. And we've got some uh, customers, for example, using multiple containers to do uh, resource isolation of uh, the devices on the hardware itself. So you can think, for example, if you've got a, uh, a device that is controlling a smart home or a smart building, it might have some functionality around controlling other devices or controlling other microcontrollers that are embedded in the environment, but it also might have some user-facing functionality that needs more frequent updates, so a, a web interface or maybe even a voice control system. Being able to isolate these in separate containers means that you can update the code of one without necessarily touching or disrupting the other. So it's a very flexible model for this sort of behavior. So having given the, the preliminaries here, let's take a look at how resin actually functions in the real world. And so what I have here is uh, an environment with a Toradex Calibri IMX6 board in the upper left. So I've got a webcam pointing at that. I have a terminal in the lower left that I'm going to be updating my code and, and doing a push from, just as if I were a software developer. And on the right, we see the resin.io uh, environment, the resin.io interface. Incidentally, I am showing the web interface here, and I will show the web interface in a little more depth uh, in a few minutes. But everything that I am showing is accessible through a command line environment and through scripting. So there's no need to actually have someone sit in front of a web interface to control these devices or to perform updates. All of this can be integrated into an existing development process, an existing device management process, or even a continuous integration system. So if you want to have a fleet of devices that is used internally for continuous testing and continuous development, this can slot directly into that process and just become the deployment and update mechanism for your internal testing as well as production. But let's take a look at it in action. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by looking at some source code of a device, and uh, excuse me, of an application. You can see this is very simple. It just displays an image. And all I'm going to do is change the image that is displayed. So I'll save that file. I'm going to add that to my source control repository and commit it. And I'll put in a nice message so that uh, my colleagues know what I've done. And now at this point, I'm going to, uh, I've added this to source code control. I'm going to push this into the resin servers. So again, this is the part where Resin is going to receive the code and begin processing it. So what we're looking at now is the source code being uploaded. Once that happens, we will begin to build, cross-compile and build a Docker image for that. So that's what we see right now is the Docker image being created. And again, this is the container that will hold this entire environment and deliver it to the end device for management. 
at this point, we are actually, we have finished compiling the code. It was very, very simple code, so the compilation doesn't take long. And we are actually building and uploading the container to, um, to our internal uh, distribution environment. Once that happens, a message will go out to the device, letting it know there's an update available. And we'll start to see some things happen on the web interface side over on the right. Now, if you look on the far right of the web interface, there's a console log showing no logs yet. Um, I've intentionally cleared that just so we can see things happen. Normally, you will receive log information that is output on the console to the device at all times. So we get a unicorn on the left. That means the compilation is finished and successful. And like I said, here is the log. We're starting to see that we're downloading the application. Now, the status of this device is, is showing downloading, meaning the device is now aware of an update. It is starting to pull that update from the resin servers through the resin VPN that I outlined in the... Uh, the overview slide. Once that download is complete, and we are just starting, and it should be pretty quick because we push only deltas, that download is now complete. We're going to stop the container image and restart with the new version of that container. At no point will the board itself actually reboot. So there is not a physical hardware reboot at any time during this process. So we've stopped the previous version, we have installed the new container, and now we're starting it up. And you can see in the upper left, we've switched from the Toradex logo to the resin.io logo. And we've successfully, in about two minutes, made a code change, pushed that code change out to the device, and um, had it reflect in production successfully. Now, just to spend a couple of more minutes walking through a little bit of the functionality of what resin provides, I'm going to switch to a different application here inside of the Resin user interface. So this is another fleet of devices. Um, in this case, this is actually a fleet of Raspberry Pis that are sitting in our London office. Um, this is, instead of just being a single device, I can manage multiple devices simultaneously. So any updates I push will go to all of the, that I push to this particular application container will go to all of the devices associated with this. So just the same way I updated one device, if I had multiple devices previously as I was demoing, um, all of them would be updated simultaneously. And incidentally, uh, if you don't believe me from the name, I can also do geolocation on these devices and show if you want to see exactly where our London office is. I need to move the control panel here so I can zoom out. Um, we do some simple geolocation based on IP address. If your device has something like a GPS unit or a more accurate um, geolocation mechanism, we can provide that information out here as well. But in this case, geolocation from IP address works pretty well. This is where our London office is located. You can imagine for a fleet of devices distributed throughout the world, it becomes very useful to be able to zoom in and see which device is in which location and be sure you are managing the proper device. Um, back on the devices, we can see the entire fleet here. So this is sort of a thumbnail snapshot of what we have in this particular application. And this includes things like the device ID, its IP address, but also what version of the software we have that we are running. So these commits are generated by Git, by that source code control system. Every time a new version is committed into Git, a new commit number is generated. So at any time, we can see which devices are running the latest version. And if there are any that have, for example, been locked because they are in a, a high priority job or they are not in a maintenance window, we can monitor those devices and see what's going on with them and, and find out when they have updated and when they haven't. And in fact, if I really want to, if I have a device that um, has some bad code on it and it looks like somebody has, in fact, pushed bad code to this device uh, and I needed to update it outside of a maintenance window, I can override that. So there is um, lock override capabilities. I can do things like manual restarts of the application, even manual restarts of the device itself, re a reboot of the physical hardware. Again, all of this is scriptable and can be put into part of an automated process, but the functionality is also available here through the web interface. Um, it's also possible to add notes to individual devices here. So if I have a fleet of devices and I want to be able to keep track of, say, who a device is assigned to or what the function of that device is, if they vary from location to location, I can associate that record with the device here inside of the resin services and have that always accessible as well. More to the point around uh, individual device behavior. I can actually control devices both at a fleet level, so all of the devices, or even down to the individual device level through environment variables. 
And these environment variables are just what they sound like. So these are variables that will be available locally on the device to any application that is running on the device. So in this case, I can do things like push individual IDs to devices. I can control behavior. So we have displays on these devices. Some of them are rotated in different orientations. So we want to be able to control that. That environment variable is a very easy way to do this. But it can also be things like um, credentials. If I want to pass certificates to individual devices so that when a device um, is instantiated and first provisioned on the network, uh, it also generates some credentials or some certificates on the back end, those can be pushed through environment variables as well. Again, remembering that everything is encrypted over the wire, we don't have to worry about these things being available in clear text. Uh, there is also um, fleet level configuration of the hardware itself, and this does vary from platform to platform, um, but we also have the ability to do things like turn on and off certain resin functionality here. So I've talked about the, uh, the ability to push deltas, only the changes from one application container to another. We can actually turn that off if for whatever reason you wanted to be able to disable that functionality, that is here. So you'll see a, a large number of these uh, potential flags that can be turned on and off to really individually control how devices behave within Resin. And finally, if you really want an extra level of control or to, say, log into a device and debug when something is going wrong, because we have that VPN connection out to the device, it is possible to open a shell into the container that is running on that device itself. So this is not just uh, a shell opening onto the, and I think this is the one that somebody pushed bad code to, so we may have to find a different one. Um, this is not only the device that, uh, um, not only the, the shell on the hardware device itself, but it is a, um, a shell into the actual running container. I don't have any other devices, so I can't show you that at the moment. Um, but I can interact with the application that is running inside of that container. So again, I can control the application itself. I can do restarts of the container without affecting the physical uh, device that that container is running on. I can really get logs and debug information uh, and make any sorts of changes inside of that container that might be necessary without having to have physical access to that device. And again, all of this is also available through a command line inter interface. So I can open up a terminal and SSH into those devices through this VPN as well. Uh, finally, I just want to touch very briefly on the notion of applications. Uh, an application in a resin context is a grouping of devices that are all running the same code. So uh, this can actually be a way of distributing devices for different purposes. So for example, development, testing, production, or even if you have beta users that you want to push new functionality to without affecting um, the rest of your production users. You can easily move devices from one application to another. So if I open this device, uh, I can move this from this application to a different application that supports this same device type. Uh, what that enables me to do is say if someone opts into a beta or a customer has an issue that requires uh, a quick fix, but I don't necessarily want to push that quick fix out to the rest of my customers without going through the main testing process, I can easily move a subset of devices to a new application and push only the updated code to that new application. So it's a great way of managing varying versions or varying purposes of devices, even if they share the same underlying base code. And of course, I can have as many of these applications as I like, each targeting different types of images. So I've got all sorts of different um, types of devices that I can connect to here. Uh, and in fact, this is the device that I was just pushing code to uh, a few minutes ago, which I've now taken offline. So having said that, last couple of slides here, and then we'll open it up for questions. I did just want to point out that Resin.io is extremely popular with developers, particularly people who have experience with web development or software as a service development. And me personally, I come from that web development background and uh, am only fairly recently in the embedded space. The ability for me to take the same skills and the same tools that I was using to develop software and put it out into the world very, very quickly and have that running on a physical device uh, on my desk or on the other side of the world is really very powerful. I can use some of the same tools and some of the same scripts that I've already used to push web development very, very quickly to these physical devices. 
and this is validated across a large number of customers and a large number of industry verticals. Um, just as a few examples here, um, NVBots is one very close to my heart as they are located uh, with me in Boston. This is a 3D printing company using resin to not only control and manage the software on their 3D printers themselves, but also to use that VPN to provide a channel for the users to monitor the actual printer device and pass data back to their end users through their own services without having to set up a, a separate channel for them to pass that data. So there's a lot of flexibility within this platform that enables people to to um, really provide very rich environments from hardware to the web uh, very seamlessly. And of course we have smart buildings, point of sale, large industrial use cases. Uh, the, the wind turbine from my first slide uh, wasn't just an illustration. We do actually have customers using resin to manage devices on power generating turbines out in the field. And as you can imagine, even if you've got a, a very low power or cheap device managing those wind turbines, uh, if the device itself is thirty or forty dollars, but you take ten thousand dollars to send somebody out there to fix it if it breaks, you want to be very, very careful with that device and make sure that none of your software updates are ever going to brick it. So the the resin platform uh, really gives you the ability to push updates to those devices without uh, without breaking them. And in fact, I, something I probably should have mentioned when I was going through this architecture slide is the fact that this subset at the bottom, the, the things that are running physically on the device itself is so thin, mm -hmm. is what enables us to manage updates on devices without the risk of breaking them. So if I do push a bad update to a container, as we saw that somebody was pushing to my uh, devices in London while I was doing the webinar, uh, if I do push a bad update to those devices, the devices themselves still stay online. So even if my application crashes as soon as it's running on a device, I can still either roll back to the previous version or I can push a new version onto the device itself. So at no time do I lose connectivity to the device. But conversely, because this layer is so thin and we are doing a, a great deal to connect the, uh, the physical device directly into these containers, uh, I can do things like push Linux kernel modules inside of a container and have them inserted into the kernel running on the device. So I can do, just like I can do um, seamless and risk-free application updates, I can do seamless and risk-free driver updates of physical devices attached to my system uh, without ever worrying about restarting the device or potentially taking it offline if that kernel driver update is, is a bad one. So having said that, I will open things up for questions. Thank you very much for your time, and I would love to, um, anyone who has questions, I'd love to answer those or speak with you further. Okay, thank you very much, Ronald. Um, so we're accepting questions here. Feel free to write any questions you may have into the uh, question dialog. Um, I'll take care of brokering questions and um, and of course, I'm sure most of them will um, pertain to Ronald. So he'll jump in um, as needed. And so let's get started here. So the first question I have here is how much storage overhead um, you, and I know you talked about this a little bit, Ronald, but um, how much storage overhead is actually in um, that thin layer that you talk about? And what, what are we talking size-wise? Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer varies a little bit depending on how you look at it. So what I mean by that is on the board itself, on the physical device, the resin OS, the Docker container engine, everything that's necessary to get up and running and connected, um, it, it varies a little bit from device to device and, and use case to use case, but it's around 200, 250 megabytes. So um, there is that level of storage overhead. The upside to this is that once you have that layer uh, on the board, the actual overhead for the individual application containers is minimal. So even if I run five or six application containers, five or six Docker containers on those devices, the overhead for those might really be only uh, a couple of dozen meg per container. So we can take advantage of the fact that the underlying um, OS, the resin OS on the device, what is necessary to run Linux, most of what is necessary to run an application environment and not have to replicate that out. 
So that's a real difference between uh, containerization technology and something like a virtual machine, where every single virtual machine needs to have not only the virtual hardware and application, but its own kernel, its own running OS. In a containerized environment, we don't have to replicate, or we don't, in fact, at all replicate that running OS. We don't replicate the kernel. We don't replicate any of the hardware drivers, anything like that. It's really only the the size of the application that's necessary and whatever libraries and so forth are necessary to support that application. So the short answer is from a resin perspective, it's a, a couple of hundred meg. From an application perspective, it can be as low as maybe 10 to 15 meg uh, per container. Okay, thanks. Um, next question. How well does resin perform with uh, intermittent connectivity? Oh, another great question. We absolutely do not assume that the devices are going to be stably connected to the internet or even continuously connected. Um, we do not ever restart a container or um, bring up a new version of a container until the entire thing has been downloaded and that it has been checked to be sure that it is transferred correctly. Uh, the worst case scenario is that if you are in the middle of pulling down an update to a device and you lose connectivity, in which case the only thing that's going to happen is you continue running on the old version before, uh, until connectivity is restored. Once connectivity is restored, the download will pick back up and only once the new container is fully downloaded and ready to go will uh, any kind of update happen. So the short answer is there's really no way to have a bad update or, or to brick a device through bad connectivity, or whether that connectivity is uh, intermittent or even if it is very noisy. So if you've got a, um, a lot of corruption on the line for whatever reason, we are checking those images, we are checking that data, and if any part of that is incorrect, we will re-download that. So you do not get a bad update at any point um, during the download process. Okay, and um, let's see, we have a question. Um, uh, somebody would like to use OpenCV with Torrid exports, and um, let's see, and there's a question about um, vision recognition and if there's a driver for floral, uh, uh, FLIR thermal vision cameras. So it's probably not too specific to resin, but um, so I can answer that from the Torrid X side. Um, as far as specific drivers for those cameras, um, most likely we'd have to obtain those from FLIR. Um, I'm not aware if, if there are any that are part of the mainline kernel. Um, otherwise, that would also be an option for obtaining those drivers. Um, and then for vision recognition capabilities, uh, Tordex does have some modules which would be well suited to such applications. Probably most notably are Apollos uh, Tegra K1 module, which does have uh, some very powerful uh, CUDA cores in its GPU, which are, can be used for uh, uh, vision processing. So, um, and I think OpenCV also, just on the topic of resin, would have would would probably work very well in the containerized environment. Um, so uh, I don't foresee any problems there. Um, next question is, what is the minimum spec of processor required to run in resin? And maybe we can also tag on here um, minimum memory as well. Uh, so sure. that, that'd be for you, Ronald. Yeah, absolutely. So minimum specs for a device to run resin uh, we're not really limited so much on the CPU side, on the processor side. Uh, really anything there that is capable of running a full Linux environment will work for us. Uh, we support down to ARMv5 today, so ARM, ARMv5 on up, um, and of course x86, so 32-bit and 64-bit on um, both environments. Um, the real constraints for us come around memory and disk space. So uh, what we recommend for Resin are devices with at least 512 meg of RAM. That's not a hard limit, that is a recommendation. You can go smaller than that, uh, but you run the risk of either limiting your application. If your application needs more RAM than that, obviously you're going to need more physical RAM. But also you may lose some of the ability to do some of the hot handover functionality that I talked about. So because that does rely on having multiple containers running simultaneously, you do generally need enough RAM to have both of those containers running. Um, if your device does not need 
that kind of, you know, if it can tolerate some downtime, if you can tolerate a few seconds of downtime during the update process, um, then you may be able to go a little lower than that. Um, I would certainly not try to do less than about 256 meg, though. That's, that's really the lower bound on RAM. Similarly on storage, uh, it's, it's about the same story. We typically recommend, um, well, at least 4 gig. Again, that is based on the idea that you do need to be able to store multiple containers, multiple versions of your application simultaneously to do that update process uh, and do the handover successfully. If you have a very small application or if you don't need some of that functionality, you can reduce that footprint. And, and again, it just does vary a little bit depending on what your application and what your use case is. But um, 4 gig and 512 meg of RAM are really our, our sort of recommendations for hardware uh, support. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see, next question. Can you configure what hardware and syscalls are available for each container application? So I guess this goes in the direction of sort of um, isolation among containers. Yeah, there is a lot of really good functionality built into Docker to limit resource allocation and, um, and resource sharing between containers. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure if that does include limiting individual syscalls. That may not be functionality that is provided by Docker, uh, although it, it could be there and I, it's just something I've never had the opportunity to use. But um, generally anything that is supported by the Docker environment is supported within Resin. All of that functionality is exposed out to you and that does include um, isolation, process isolation, memory isolation, and uh, resource utilization limits. Okay, great. Uh, next question, um, again, about connectivity. Uh, if the connectivity control is part of a container and it fails, is it possible to go back to a previous version based on some timeout factor? Yes, and in fact, that is how we handle updates for the, uh, the lowest level of resin functionality. So everything that we can push into a container we do, but that does not include the actual Linux kernel, the container runtime itself, or the, um, the sort of root hardware uh, network connection to the internet and to the, the resin VPN. So for the update of those, we take advantage of um, generally U-Boot is the, the bootloader that we use on these devices. We take advantage of some of the functionality in U-Boot where you can do a, um, a parallel root file system install. So you have the old version and the new version both sitting on the device itself. And when the device boots, if uh, a watchdog does not come up within a certain amount of time on the new version, it will fall back to the old. So basically there is um, a, a mechanism built into the platform for ensuring that even if the, the stuff that's physically on the device itself has a bad push, that we do at least fall back to the previous version there and don't brick the device or take it offline. Okay. Um... The next question, can you give examples of industrial use cases and or past experience customers? And I think we heard some of these already, but uh, feel free to elaborate. Sure, yeah, we, um, we like to say we have everything from smart locks to smart buildings to skyscrapers. So, um, you know, the smallest application of resin that I have personally seen is a smart lock system. So these are um, it's, it's very similar to Airbnb. It's a, a house sharing system, but instead of just having people provide keys through some third party, they have uh, much more of a zip car approach. So you can actually lock and unlock uh, houses online. So they use resin to manage these smart locks and to be able to update and address those individual locks uh, and do all of the things that I talked about around rolling out new functionality, um, having beta testers, etc. And then on the other end of scale from there, we do have smart buildings. So there are uh, part of LEED certification, the energy efficiency certification in the US is to um, you know, have a lot of control of systems and be able to um, optimize energy usage throughout the day, throughout a building. So these systems require work to uh, work very closely with the HVAC systems or with the physical um, things like louvers on the side of the buildings. So we have resin in those applications as well. So all of the examples that I was talking about, about having control systems and devices that are crucial to the functionality of a smart building uh, that are not necessarily easily to easy to access physically, 
all of those are real world use cases. So in fact, all of the use cases that I've brought up, even power generation, 3D printing, digital signage, and customers who are using it in production today. So there's um, there's really not an industry I can think of that doesn't that resin is not currently playing in uh, that it could aside from possibly wearables. I, I just haven't seen any wearables that are really full Linux environments yet. But as soon as they get there, we'll have resin running on them. All right, excellent. Um, so the next question, uh, this pertains, I, it looks specifically like the Yocto project build uh, of a resin image. Um, and the question is, um, let's see, if there, um, is there for low level change, or is there a way for low level changes to be made to this image? And I presume either through the Octo project build or maybe through the actual resin update uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. We have full support for um, custom images running on a board, and that is both for new device um, the addition of custom devices or new devices. So if you have custom hardware and you want to enable resin on that hardware, um, you can just go through a Yocto build process and do that. But that also applies to um, making changes to the base image. And there is information on our website under the documentation. Uh, if you go to the doc, docs.resin.io, uh, on the left there is a navigation panel. If you look under advanced, there is instructions on exactly how to build a custom resin base image based on a Yocto board support package. Okay, and the next question, would ResinIO work with devices connected at the edge over low bandwidth, uh, LP WAN technologies like uh, Zigbee or possibly even LoRaWAN? Uh, so for example, 200 kilobit uh, down, 20 kilobit, um, or uh, 200 to, all the way down to 20 kilobit speeds or half duplex communication. Um, do you have any specific use cases of such low bandwidth kind of applications? Sure. Uh, so there, there's kind of two answers to that one as well. One of which is if you are looking to push an update onto a device that is connected through one of those mechanisms, as long as that, um, that radio is providing some connection to the internet, then it really doesn't matter to us what the actual physical implementation is. So bandwidth doesn't matter, um, you know, physical mechanism doesn't matter. As long as we can get the data, we can use resin, we can transport um, resins containers over that. Having said that, I think the more interesting answer is the other direction, where you have a device, say a gateway device, that is connected to the internet via Ethernet or Wi-Fi or something similar to that. And that device is also connected out through something like Zigbee to microcontrollers that are not directly connected to the internet. So those might not even be Linux capable devices. Those might be the sort of 8-bit microcontroller devices that I talked about earlier. We do have support coming for that model very soon where you have the, the gateway device, the one that's connected to the internet, um, running resin and then using resin to receive updates and pass those along to the, um, we call them dependent devices. So this is a thing that um, is coming in a, a very near term release of resin uh, and is something we're working on today. So that support should be there very, very soon. Okay, and um, a question about uh, what Tordex modules are currently supported, and I can sort of jump in here and say that currently Resin has um, provided support for our Calibri IMX6 module, uh, and we've had some come next, but I think this is uh, the Calibri IMX6 was a good um, good starting point, and so we're really looking to see where the interest is. Uh, from customers in terms of uh, where to take uh, our resin partnership. So we'd love to hear if there's another module um, out there that uh, you would really like this capability on. And obviously there are some limitations regarding uh, resources, uh, resource availability. So some of our low-end modules, um, at least in the current um, state of uh, the resin platform would probably not be suitable, but uh, pretty much anything from our mid to high end modules uh, could be supported. So we'd like to hear from um, from everybody, you know, if, if there is a, another module that you would like to see resin on. 
And um, I'll also pass that question on to Ronald to see if he has anything he would like to add. No, I, I think you did a good overview there. Uh, but I would say it, you know, it is very straightforward us for straightforward for us to add support for new boards. Um, again, basically anything that that meets the minimum specs that I outlined earlier and uh, is running Linux is something that we can add in generally very easily and quickly. So if there are um, boards that people are interested, Toradex boards that people are interested in having support uh, within Resin, we'd love to hear from you uh, and come work with you on that. Okay, well that appears to be the end of the questions here. Um, I would like to thank everybody who um, joined us today. Uh, big thanks to Ronald for joining us uh, and giving us the presentation from Resin.io. Um, I know that Toradex is very excited to see where this uh, partnership leads and, and what um, kinds of uh, products our customers can um, leverage Resin.io on. So. Uh, thanks again, everybody. The webinar recording will be available um, in a few days uh, at toradex.com slash webinars as well as YouTube. And uh, also check out the webinars page for um, future webinars. And of course, let us know if you um, have an interest in Resin.io. Um, we'd love to get in touch and just talk about your requirements and um, what we can work together on to uh, enable uh, your application. So um, thanks again, everybody, and we'll catch you at the next webinar.